You're a claustrophobic. <laughs> Fist in the mouth? Mm -mm. I've never even looked at another guy before. To tell you the truth, I've never been that into the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I've never seen any of the cartoons or read any of the comics or even played any of the games. So what I'm telling you is that I'm very qualified to talk about them. My introduction to the series instead has always been from their numerous theatrical outings, namely the 2007 animated movie and the Michael Bay produced live action film that was kind of hard to avoid when it came out. And ever since their big screen debut in the 90s, the Turtles have been back for another five films. And though there have also been a few home video movies and TV specials, I I think I'm only going to be sticking to theatrical releases this time around, so my sincerest apologies to the Turtles Forever movie that I probably wouldn't be able to properly appreciate anyway, and the incredible Batman vs Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie which I highly recommend checking out if you want, it's so good. Just recently I found the original 90s Ninja Turtle movies on Netflix and then it all just kind of became a whole thing from there. Big Apple. Yeah. So in 1990, the Turtle cartoon had been running for about three years and was enormously popular. And more importantly, very merchandisable. Seriously, people were buying anything with Turtles on it. And yet, in spite of that, several large Hollywood studios weren't confident in financing a movie based on the series with fears that it would underperform at the box office. And so it was left to the independent studio New Line Cinema to distribute it. Up to the task of bringing the film to life was Jim Henson's Creature Shop, who created the Turtle suits and facial animatronics. And it is genuinely remarkable both how good and expressive they look in the actual film and how they were able to make any form of fight scenes as good as they are with these likely very heavy and uncomfortable turtle costumes. The film was closely worked on by the original turtle comic creators who were the main driving force in ensuring this movie stuck closer to their vision of the turtles being darker and grittier. So you've got plenty of violence and torture and worst of all, they even swear in this. Damn! I know. I adore the way this movie looks. The way they present New York and just the overall cinematography in general is so good. Like with the way they do Shredder's introduction where he first appears as this foreboding shadow, there's so much care and thought put into the presentation of everything that makes it so much better than I'm sure anyone, including myself, expected it to be. The story covers the familiar ground of reporter April O'Neil investigating the mysterious Shredder and his foot clan and eventually running into the Ninja Turtles and learning of their backstory with the ooze, which is shown to us where the film briefly becomes comes a horror movie. One of them spoke. Pizza. Pizza. What Pizza. the fuck? They also team up with vigilante Casey Jones and from there after Splinter is kidnapped by the foot they have to come together and work out how to save him all on their own. With the film ending with the iconic rooftop battle where the turtles get their shit kicked in by Shredder until Splinter steps in to throw him off a building to be crushed to death in a garbage truck. As with the turtles and Splinter themselves, the casting for both April and Casey are fantastic in this and though I know I don't know the characters all that well, to me at least, everyone was adapted in such a perfect way that I was smiling the entire way through I was watching this. A focus of the movie is how crime and violence is affecting New York and particularly its kids who are prime targets to be recruited by the Foot Clan. But they made the mistake of making being part of an evil ninja cult look fucking awesome. I mean look these guys have arcade machines and shit. A highlight for me is the scene before the final battle where they all retreat to a farmhouse to recover their wounds. And there's just a lot of great character moments between the cast where you get to see April and Casey growing fond of one another and the turtles having to deal with the loss of Splinter. It's so grounded and well done and just so not what I was expecting from the Ninja Turtles. The film thankfully released to an enormous box office success thanks in part I'm sure to the turtle power rap that was written especially for the movie and is honestly kind of fire. He's the leader of the group. So of course with them having made a genuinely fantastic, well-rounded, mature movie that can be enjoyed by both kids and adults alike, it received a flood of complaints from overly sensitive parents who whined about how it was too dark and violent. Do you think parents should let their kids see the movie? That's... <laughs> And so such complaints drastically impacted how the second film was made. Let's kick shout! Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 The Secret of the Use was released less than a full year after the first, as the studio wanted to cash in on the turtle hype as much as they could before it was over. And while it is pretty obvious that it's a much sillier and toned down movie for kids, I still think Secret of the Use is a lot of fun. This one's about Shredder's completely unexpected return where he learns that the research group TGRI still has some of the ooze that created the turtles in the first place and uses it to create mutations of his own to try and defeat them. None of the trailers and marketing spoiled who these new creatures were, however, instead of using the immensely popular Bebop and Rocksteady from the cartoon, as I am sure literally everyone was anticipating, two new characters were introduced called Toka and Razar. It's said that the reason for this was because the comic creators didn't want to use anything from the show that they themselves didn't make, but it seemed like there were some other issues with copyright and licenses that didn't extend to those characters. Something like that, I'm sure, I don't know. Regardless, we got these two and they are great.
Secret of the Ooze definitely lacks the edge that made the first one stand out so much, but it's still an undeniably fun time. It's just as funny and the set design is still top notch, especially with the Turtles' new hideout that I really want to live in, though the action scenes are noticeably goofier, to the point where none of the Turtles actually use any of their weapons in combat at the request of the producers. That's a workaround, alright? The tone wasn't the only thing that was affected though. In an effort to dial down the violence, Casey Jones was removed from the film entirely. Poor guy doesn't even get a mention. He is instead replaced with this new character, Kino, a pizza delivery guy who happens to know martial arts that befriends the turtles and helps them to infiltrate the foot. And while he feels like a completely random addition, he's actually played by the guy who was Leonardo's suit double from the original, who impressed the filmmakers so much that they gave him a more substantial role this time. And this is all of course without bringing up the ninja rap, the vanilla ice song that was created especially for the movie. It's seriously impossible to watch this entire dance sequence and not have a stupid grin on your face. Unfortunately though, much like with any popular gritty movie that had sequels that toned down the violence and mature themes to appeal to kids, Secret of the Ooze wasn't received as well, and parents and critics complained that the turtles were too annoying and obnoxious to sit through. What do you people want? Prehistoric turtle sword. With the third film in the series, a lot more things had to be changed with it as they took a bit more time with this one, as it came out in 1993. In this one, April randomly comes across the Time Scepter that sends her back to ancient Japan, and in her place arrives the son of a Japanese emperor. So the turtles have to go back in time to save her, and in the meantime help a village fight against British colonists with guns and said emperor's army. And three definitely feels very different to the other two when you watch them all back to back. I mean, where Ooze felt a little bit different with minor changes, three feels like much more of a departure, which I think is mostly the the fault of the animatronics taking a bit of a dip in quality, as this time they weren't worked on by Jim Henson's company, but instead some other guys. Animatronics that, by the way, have not aged very well. I mean, Splinter doesn't even get up for the entire movie. He literally does not get up his rat ass. Casey's back, though. He doesn't do all that much, but hey, I'm still happy about it. His entire role essentially is just to babysit the four warriors that were swapped out in place of the turtles, and that's about the entire extent of his contribution to the film. Three follows the footsteps of being as goofy as Secret of the Ooze, though for some reason the turtles are significantly more annoying in this one. Uh, yes. Ooh. Wow. A legorama. Yeah, I'll say. Hey. I'm allowed. Absolutely! Swing! <laughs> Unfortunately, the filmmakers may have had a point about rushing Secret of the Ooze out so quickly because it seemed like there was very little fanfare for this one coming out in the entire production overall. I mean, they didn't even do a rap this time, so that's how you know they weren't feeling it. I think by that point, the Ninja Turtles craze had died down a little, and on top of that, many people do not like this one very much. It's a motherfucking fact that this pile of dog shit called Ninja Turtles 3 is the most god-awful disgrace in human existence. I mean, I kind of liked it, but I mean, whatever, man. I saw a comment on Reddit where someone brought up that they would have liked it a lot more had it showcased the origin of the foot when they went back in time and fought against some sort of ancestor to Shredder. It would have definitely made this one feel more cohesive with the others, though while it's definitely my least favorite of the three, I don't mind it as it is. And in spite of the diminishing returns, a fourth live-action turtle movie was planned at first by the name of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles The Foot Walks Again. Nice. Which was then changed to the next mutation, which would somehow eventually morph into the live action show that everyone now knows and hates very much. You know, the one that has the turtle with boobs. Neon Knight Rider. Dude, I could be gaming. And after a 14 year gap in 2007, the series returned to cinemas with an entirely CG animated film made by the relatively unknown Imagi Animation Studios, which is simply called TMNT, because it was the mid 2000s and we were edgy like that back then. I never saw this in cinemas, but instead had this bootlegged DVD copy that someone must have given to my parents at some point. I have no idea who or where, but I feel like I'm better off not knowing. This was the film that introduced me to the turtles in the first place and even now upon rewatch, I still think it's fantastic. Team and T brings back all your familiar faces with April, Casey, and the Foot Clan returning, but it's entirely devoid of the Shredder, who as they explain in the opening, they've already beaten off screen. Because, as it turns out, this is actually the fourth film in an ongoing story from the original trilogy. There's literally even a bit at the end that always went over my head where Splinter goes up to a display cabinet which has the Time Scepter, a canister of ooze, and Shredder's helmet from across the trilogy. I didn't know this at all, and that's so awesome to me. The plot this time round is a little bit more complicated than usual. So you've got this millionaire guy called Max Winters who is actually an ancient warlord who 3,000 years ago opened a portal that granted him immortality but turned four of his generals into stone and also unleashed 13 monsters into the world. And so now in modern times he has to collect them all in order to break the curse and send them back to where they came from. 
Right. And in the meantime, you have each of the turtles having drifted apart ever since Shredder's defeat and spending time doing their own things. And the rest of the film is about them banding back together, with there being a particular focus on the conflict between Raph and Leo, which culminates in this absolutely incredible fight scene that is easily the highlight of the whole thing for me. It's so good, man. The environments look gorgeous, and the animation in general has aged surprisingly well. Ah, mostly. God. All of the characters and their interactions are fantastic, and while the story is definitely something different, it's really tightly written the way they balance this complicated prophecy plot, as well as the turtles reuniting and learning to work as a team again. Even if I had no idea what was going on as a kid, but hey, those stone guys look pretty cool. I mean, really, the only thing wrong with it is that you have to see this at the beginning. TMNT opened at number one at the box office on its opening weekend, making almost three times its budget, which, while not a smash hit by any means, is certainly a sizably impressive amount for a smaller studio's first ever theatrical release. And originally, the director, Kevin Monroe, had envisioned this story to be a trilogy, and everything looked like it was going fine until Nickelodeon bought out the Turtles in 2009, and Imaji had to shut down the following year due to the financial failure of Astro Boy. There was even teaser art that was made for this hypothetical sequel that would have been a Michelangelo-focused movie and saw the reintroduction of their version of Shredder, which we would only ever get to see in toy form. God, I want this so bad! It's such a huge shame that we'll never get to see this project realized because it's clear from TMNT alone that the Turtles were in really good hands with Imaji, and it's the reason I consider it to be my favorite Turtle movie of the bunch. So this one gets away with not having a rap. Where no turtle has gone before. And then we all know what happened next. The 2014 live-action TMNT reboot that was produced by Michael Bay, and yet everyone always lays the blame with him. I'm not entirely sure how much involvement he actually had, but as we're all used to in line with the Bay film, this one has a lot more dumb humor, excessive explosions, and Megan Fox, who is actually a whole lot better here than she was in any Transformers movie. But is there anything else we should know about them? They're ninjas. I'm sorry, what? and they do karate. I remember vividly the reaction at the time of this coming out was sort of a mini version of what happened with the Sonic trailer, where there was this absolute vitriol toward Michael Bay destroying yet another popular franchise and ruining everyone's childhoods and all that. MC Mikey. MC. Rumors even circulated that they were changing the turtles into aliens, which originated from a leaked script called The Blue Door that did the rounds in 2012 that would have changed both the turtles and Shredder's origins into extraterrestrial beings from Dimension X. Shredder would have been called Colonel Schrader, who Mikey would have just nicknamed Shredder, and the turtles had parents who were killed by Krang, which was another thing people were using against it until it was dropped in favor of what they eventually went with. So they're aliens? No, that's stupid. Though, to be honest, I like this one a lot more the second time round. I do think there's plenty to appreciate about it. The visual effects and the fight scenes are pretty solid, especially the final fight with the Turtles and Shredder. I'm glad they're keeping the tradition alive of Shredder beating the shit out of the Turtles on a rooftop. I thought it was also a lot funnier than I remember it being, and they do a pretty good job with each of the Turtles' characters, and even Splinter, who is a lot more abusive in this one, as well as adding in a character played by Will Arnett, who serves as April's cameraman and challenges Michelangelo to see who can make the most shitty jokes. Oh, Neil, what are you doing? Yeah, that's good. Make sure you're getting everything. In order to make the turtles appear more realistic and modern, they for some reason made all of them look oh, like hello, Shrek man. and gave them pants, which has some horrible implications. Yeah, that makes it look really fucking appealing. <laughs> In terms of all of the realistic live action designs I've seen, though, they definitely grew on me throughout the film, but I don't think oh they're that bad. Never mind. Right? But I think people's problems extended outside of the turtles looking like they were going to eat you. Unfortunately, this one lets down in other areas, like the uncomfortable amount of jokes made about Michelangelo being into bestiality. Oh, she's so hot, I can feel my shell tightening. Ew. Oh, and guess what? They did a rat. Bam. It's science, okay, people? I'm telling you. The final shell shock. The sequel was released two years later, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Out of the Shadows. The biggest surprise to me with this one was that they actually took from the criticisms from the first and used it to improve it in every possible way. Huh? The main way they do this is by introducing more long-standing turtle characters like Casey Jones, Krang, and finally making their theatrical debut 25 years later, Bebop and Rocksteady. About <laughs> fucking time. Yeah, beeps? Well, I got a big bang for you. This one leans a lot more into the silly nature of the Turtles cartoon, which I feel like you kind of have to if you're going to do Krang. And this time, Shredder gets broken out of prison within like the first five minutes and sets out to open a portal to another dimension that he was told about by Krang, which he does, and then immediately dies, like before the movie even ends. There's not even an after credit scene where he shows up again. He's actually just dead. Out of the Shadows feels a bit similar to Secret of the Ooze with TCRI returning and Shredder coming back to be completely useless to the overall plot. Get ready to take a trip, boys. You're going to Brazil. Ah! 
The difference is that this one actually has Casey Jones in it, who this time is introduced as a police officer who goes off on his own to find Shredder before eventually teaming up with the Turtles. I don't like him nearly as much as the 90s Casey, but I thought he was alright. They actually found a way to work in his hockey stuff, which I was honestly not expecting. The main conflict in this one is that the Turtles are understandably frustrated that people are absolutely horrified of them, and upon getting the mutagen that made Bebop and Rocksteady, they learn that it has the potential to turn them into humans. It could turn us into humans. <laughs> I think they do a much better job with the turtles as characters in this one, and I did enjoy their company a whole lot more. And wow, no mentions of Mikey being horny, and suddenly it's a better movie. Who would have thought? This reboot series again was planned to be a trilogy, with most of the cast signing on for about three films. So it was generally more well received by fans and general audiences, and it looked like this series was going to be headed in a positive direction. But it didn't make enough money, so they cancelled the possibility of the third film. They didn't even get to go back in time. And guess what? There was no rap again. Rap? No rap. Rap? Come on, guys. And so that's where we're at now. Of course, they're already prepping for another Turtle reboot, looking to be called TMNT The Next Chapter, which is set to release in 2023 and is being produced by Seth Rogen, of all people. Okay. Regardless, thank you for listening to me talk about the Ninja Turtles for 15 minutes as someone who barely knows anything about the Ninja Turtles, and I'll see you all next time. Yeah. Go, Ninja! Go, Ninja! Go!